Uh, I'm Stephen McMahon from the George Institute at the University of Sydney, uh, and I'm going to be chairing the session tonight. Um, the topic tonight is obesity. Is the food industry more part of the problem than part of the solution? And we have two um, uh, very well-known speakers, um, Rosemary Stanton, uh, who I'm sure is well known to all of you, uh, and Derek Yak, who will also be well known to many of you. Each of the speakers is going to speak for about 20 or 25 minutes, um, and then when we've had both presentations, uh, we can open the, uh, the discussion up uh, for comments and questions. Um, I'd like to begin by uh, uh, introducing uh, Dr. Rosemary Stanton. Uh, Rosemary is, I'm sure, well known to all of you. She was described to me today as our celebrity nutritionist. Uh, <laughs> and, um, but certainly I have no doubt that she's uh, the best known um, commentator on issues of nutrition uh, in Australia today. Um, uh, Rosemary was, uh, has been recognised in various ways for her enormous contribution. That contribution includes, I might add, 32 books and the terrifying number of 3,200 articles for magazines and newspapers, uh, which for those of us who sort of tend to count in the hundreds of things we've done, thousands is absolutely terrifying. Uh, but for, for all of this work and uh, her contributions, for example, to the National Health and Medical Research Council, Dietary Guidelines Working Committee, and arguably to state, territory, and, and federal governments. She was awarded the Order of Australia Medal uh, in 1998 for services to community health. And then in 2000, she received an honorary doctorate also for her uh, contribution to uh, nutrition on Australia, which again, I think, arguably is second to none. Um, Rosebury's uh, main aim is to change Australians' poor eating habits uh, so that people have healthier diets, eat more enjoyable foods which create minimal environmental change, uh, and to this end she maintains equal interests in the twin areas of food and nutrition. So with that I'd like to, in uh, to uh, welcome Rosemary. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the warm welcome. It's nice to still be welcomed, even if you're an ex-celebrity. Ex, by the way, because it was decided that it was too much for the good citizens of Australia to see me on television because I was so old. Um, I won't go into the other details of why I was dismissed, but they were largely to do with, with age and the fact I was female. I had a few wrinkles, to say nothing of grey hair. Um, but I, I'm happy to talk about this topic tonight. and you. There's no surprises in the side of the argument that I'm likely to take. But I will start by acknowledging that obesity is obviously a multifactorial problem. There's no simple solution, no magic bullet. And I'd also, of course, like to make it clear that uh, low levels of physical activity are a big factor. I spent the weekend uh, down at Mount Stromlo at the 24-hour mountain bike race. I hasten to assure you not racing, but supporting uh, children, uh, in-laws and granddaughter. Uh, racing for the first time. But we do, and I thought it was interesting because there was an audience of about 5,000 people down there and I walked around uh, for about 12 hours and I couldn't see a single fat person. An interesting lot. But for the rest of us, passive entertainment and the changes in the type of work we do or don't do, the car culture and the huge distances between home and work and school and the shops have a lot to answer for. Among many of the people who speak for the food industry, at least in Australia, the most popular tactic is to call for more physical activity. Nobody stands to lose from it and nobody can deny it's important. But while I and many of my colleagues think we should all push for a physical environment that makes physical activity a natural part of life, an increase in physical activity simply can't solve the current obesity problem. Just to correct the current energy imbalance and prevent further weight gain, would require walking briskly for an extra 80 to 90 minutes a day. So I think we shouldn't shirk away from the other side of the energy equation, which is what we eat and drink. And this is much less popular because some sections of the food industry do stand to lose in such a debate. The food industry, of course, has given us a plentiful food supply, unprecedented in its almost round-the-clock availability. Its abundance is presented to us as choice. And clever and persuasive advertising constantly urges us to take advantage of this choice 
lest we miss out on any of the pleasures of eating and drinking any of the 30,000 different food items that the average supermarket stocks in this country. We also have more than 1,800 different snack food items for our choice. I would ask, however, who is really served by this choice that has even changed the language so that we are no longer referred to as citizens, we are now consumers. Some of us think that it's difficult to change people's eating habits, but in fact the food industry is very good at it and has had such remarkable success that we no longer eat and drink what people did even 40 years ago. One of the examples would be the powerfully persuasive skills that have changed what we drink. I mean, the human race quenched its thirst with water for millions of years, but many people, especially children, have now been convinced that water is boring. This concept has opened up a huge market for alcoholic beverages, as well as literally hundreds of sweetened drinks. The industry keeps advocating change, so that if we don't want coloured flavoured sugar water, we can now move to vitamin waters, which is sold in my local pharmacy. These happen to be a very expensive way to get vitamins we don't need in sweet cordials that play havoc with dental enamel, but they're marketed as a choice, a healthy choice and available in different flavours and colours so that they won't become boring. Or you can opt for energy drinks, complete with a hefty dose of caffeine, plus sugar and the added and almost totally spurious benefits of ingredients such as taurine, which as many of you know is an amino acid essential for cats, but presumably designed to appeal to humans for the similarity of its name to Taurus the bull. And for those concerned about obesity, of course, there are artificially sweetened drinks. I suspect few people realise the huge carbon footprint created by these artificial ingredients. But the cleverest drink of all is now water. Marketers have made it socially acceptable by chilled branded plastic bottles of water at something between 1,000 and 10,000 times the cost of what comes out of your tap or tank. And the result has been that several hundred billion plastic water bottles now litter the world. The effects of choice are not new. Those of us that did biochemistry knew years ago that when you offer rats a cafeteria diet, they will eat more than if you just give them their standard chow. And so do humans, give us lots of choice and we eat more. 40 years ago, Australians had between 600 and 800 foods to choose from, and of course many of them were only available seasonally. We didn't weigh people in those days because obesity was simply not an issue. The current overabundant food environment, coupled with less physical movement, has changed all that. The majority of adults in this country are now over, overweight or obese, and of course the same applies to about a quarter of our children. Excess body fat has now been normalised so that many people no longer even notice it in themselves or their children. It is now also normal to eat and drink excessively. Sizes of foods have changed, snack foods, drinks, even our plates and glasses have changed. We serve pasta or even soup in dishes that my mother would have considered were serving dishes for the whole family. A typical glass of wine now contains two standard drinks. A bottle of soft drink that was once a special treat for a birthday dinner is now cons consumed as a single daily serve. Excess has become normal. Why is this so and what can we do about it? Because before we can come up with any solutions, I think we better need to understand the cause. Basically, it is this. The stomach is finite, albeit larger than it used to be, but the more we put into it, the greater the profit for those who market foods and drinks. Drinks are particularly useful because studies show that our normal satiety signals don't work well when we take our kilojoules in liquid form. Dietary fibre, of course, acts as a natural obstacle to overeating, so if you remove the fibre from grains, you can pack in more food before people feel full. If you add rapid dough rises to breads, you increase your profit because you decrease the amount of time it takes to make the bread, but it also changes the nature of the starch so that the bread is digested more rapidly. Fast foods, of course, use bread rolls that are so soft that they almost dissolve between your tongue and the roof of your mouth. And the fact that you don't have to chew them means that you can actually eat more before you register that you're full. 
Very few people overconsume fruits and vegetables because physically it's difficult to do so unless you remove their fibre and turn them into juice, which is easy to overconsume and is a problem. Government messages about healthy eating are drowned when the total amount spent on health promotion in Australia, including the campaigns to eat more fruit and vegetables, is less than a single company spends advertising just one soft drink. There's no real mystery about obesity. Over the 10-year period when obesity and overweight increased dramatically in Australian children, their kilojoule intake went up by 13 per cent. Physical inactivity was already firmly in place at this time, but consumption patterns changed. And over that 10-year period, intake of fruits and vegetables, except for juice and chips, decreased. And there was no increase in any staple foods. Things like milk, for example, didn't change. Instead, we had consumption of carbonated drinks, fast foods, biscuits, snacks, confectionery, and various sugary foods all increased. Why? There was no mystery. The overconsumption of products that had been advertised during when, times when children were watching television went up. Foods that are advertised sell well. We have virtually no ads for fresh fruit and vegetables. When did you last see an ad for green beans or carrots? I mean, it just doesn't happen. Most food advertisements feature energy-dense, nutrient-poor foods, which are what the public and the Macquarie Dictionary in Australia call junk foods, because these are where the greatest profits lie. The food industry uses a somewhat quaint term, value added. In practice, value adding means minimising any expensive or bulky ingredients and increasing the cheap fillers. And the cheapest fillers are sugar, highly processed starches and fat. If we take potatoes as an example, straight potatoes sell for somewhere between one and two dollars a kilogram, depending on the size of the, the bag you buy. You add 10% fat and turn them into chips and they're about $4 a kilogram in those frozen packs. Cut them more finely and add 30% of fat to make potato crisps, and you can sell them for $20 a kilogram. The fat was very cheap, cheaper than the potato in this country. Unfortunately for those concerned about obesity, the kilojoules go up three to four fold for chips and then double again for the potato crisps. Can we really expect to get people to reduce consumption when processed food companies' profits depend on getting us to consume more? Can we expect results when food companies lobby governments to ignore the reports that they've commissioned from experts which suggest curtailing advertising when children are watching television? And they actively campaign against food labelling systems that have the potential to turn people away from some foods. Is there really any possibility of a win-win solution to tackle obesity without impinging on food industry profits? The food industry says it wants to be part of the solution, and I have no doubt that there are sections of the food industry with whom we can work. I do. Some companies are prepared to make genuinely beneficial changes, and we can definitely work with those selling fresh foods who really need our help. What about individual choice? I doubt anyone would argue against the need for individuals to make healthier choices, but we need to make it easy for that to happen. Our current systems make it difficult for the individual, and so we have to change the factors within both the physical and food environments that have made the less healthy choices the cheapest, the easiest, and the norm. Some sections of the food industry, aided by the politicians they support, take the attitude that if you're fat, you should develop a bit of character and smarten yourself up, go to the gym, go on a diet. You should also be strong enough to resist the pester power your children are urged to use after they've been connected to advert games on the internet or been subjected to persuasive TD advertising. This is very difficult. And it's made worse because many who are overweight don't see themselves or their children as overweight, mainly because being overweight is now normal in our society. Of those who do realise they're too fat, I have yet to meet a single one who consciously decided to eat more and exercise less so that they would grow fatter and increase their risk of health problems. Most people who do realise they are too fat would like to be thinner and would welcome seeing and using their knees again. Sadly, many do not understand how small pieces of confectionery or anything that's just a liquid can translate into a large belly. And the products certainly don't make that plain. 
The food industry constantly tells us that there are no good or bad foods, and I agree that foods have, they don't have moral characteristics, but there are foods that we should consume only in small quantities, and we need to give people a simple way to identify these foods at the point of purchase. Clear food lab labelling could turn people off buying some products or at least warn them of the potential dangers of consuming more than a small quantity. And trials of traffic light labels on food products show they have the desired effect of decreasing sales of products bearing red lights. Such labelling is actually actively opposed by the food industry in Australia, who prefer percentage daily intake labels that put the onus on the individual to read and interpret quite complex information, often for 12 different nutrients. Now, I've been a nutritionist for 44 years, I think, and when I look at some of those products, I'm not quite sure whether it means I should buy them or not. What does the percentage DI mean? I certainly don't know how they would relate to a child because the percentage DI quantities apply to normal weight adults who are a minority group in our population. Can the food industry show us any decrease in sales of any product bearing a percentage DI label? Tackling obesity means that we need to decrease consumption, and I doubt the food industry will be happy to come to that particular party. Their aim, understandably from their viewpoint, is to sell more. In seeking to sell more, some food companies see a win-win solution in producing foods and drinks with artificial versions of fats and sugars that provide no kilojoules. Food technologists can devise fats that pass straight through the body, and they're working on starches that resist the action of digestive enzymes and don't end up causing too much flatal effect when they get to the, to the uh, colon. Um, and there's apparently some new rice flour batter I was reading about last week that absorbs only half as much fat during deep frying. This is all very clever. But rather than converting rice into batter, why can't we just eat less deep fried food? The question I think we need to answer is, should we use the world's resources to produce fake foods so that overfed people can eat even more without getting fatter, while more than a billion people go to bed hungry every night because they don't have enough food? We live in a globalised world but the poor are often involved in growing food for the rich, or even for the rich person's motor vehicles. Is this really a solution we are happy with? Others seek to make products healthy, legitimising sweetened water, sugary breakfast cereals, snacks or confectionery by adding vitamins or minerals that sound good but are superfluous to our real nutritional needs. Are these really solutions? The European Food Safety Authority apparently thinks not. They recently, just last week, rejected the majority of over 4,000 health claims that were put to it. So let me end on a more positive note with some changes to the food marketing that I think could help solve the obesity problem. The first is to limit advertising. Now, we can't prove this would work. Nobody can do a study of two groups of children matched for all aspects of their lives, except one group watches TV ads and the other doesn't. Even in the few countries that do control advertising, certainly for programs directed at children, the programs complete with ads are beamed in from neighbouring countries. However, it defies logic that advertisers could convince food companies to spend millions on, food, on advertising if it didn't increase sales. And I need no more proof that advertising works than the food and advertising industry's consternation about any attempts to ban it. The Australian Food and Grocery Council in Australia and some fast food companies acknowledge that advertising plays a role and they've proposed a self-regulatory system to limit advertising to what they designate as healthy products during programs directed at children. I won't go into the definition of healthy just now, but this will really have little effect. Since children are usually watching shows outside the official one hour of children's programming a day, and these other shows, of course, attract a greater audience of children where the ads will be just the normal ads that we all see. There are also no penalties for non-compliance. Why would this work? I believe we need a mandatory government system to, system to stop advertising of all junk foods between 7am and 9pm. And this also needs to include the advergaming directed at children that is actually taking over from TV advertising. 
This insidious method has children being assailed by advertisements and product placement throughout computer programs and computer games that they may play for 30 to 60 minutes, so they're constantly bombarded with these images. They may even have to buy the product to enter the game. My second suggestion is that we make some version of traffic light labelling compulsory on all processed foods. Australian studies show that shoppers from all social and education levels find it easier to make healthier choices with red, green and yellow indications of saturated fat and sugar and salt. My third suggestion is that we encourage the move to growing vegetables. Studies show that children with access to home or community gardens, or people rather with access to community gardens, the children with access uh, to a school kitchen garden eat more vegetables. The interest is actually there. Sales of vegetable seals, seeds are soaring in Australia and there are long waiting lists for the opportunity to participate in community gardens. And these gardens, of course, have va valuable social as well as nutritional benefits, and there are some wonderful ones, uh, certainly down around the Wollongong area, where some of the people from Timor and other countries who couldn't get the sorts of herbs they wanted have set up community gardens, and they are now part of the community, they are fated by the community, and everyone else wants to come and uh, buy their herbs, which seems to me a terrific sort of thing to do. The fourth thing which is related is that I think we need to teach everybody to cook, preferably starting an infant school, but with government subsidised classes for adults. This can be done in conjunction with school kitchen gardens as they expand throughout the country and would be a boon to those sections of the food industry that are involved in primary production, because we must differentiate, I think, between different sections of the food industry. My fifth suggestion is one for the processed food industry, and that is that they reduce portion sizes. We had big headlines that uh, one of the companies marketing confectionery was going to reduce their portion sizes and it never happened. When I asked them why, they said, oh, we decided it wasn't commercially viable. They got the headlines and the kudos for people thinking they were going to do it, but they didn't do it. We need it done. And while it won't help the obesity issue, I certainly applaud the current move by some companies to reduce salt levels and switch to healthier fats. But could we also have a reduction in the sugar content in breakfast cereals, please? My sixth and final point is that I think we need to take climate change seriously and support moves to incorporate a carbon and possibly a water footprint on all foods. This is probably the single most important move that could tackle climate change and obesity together. So I propose that the government tax junk foods and drinks based on their products, carbon and water footprint. Figures for this will be available by mid next year, and it would take us that long to get around to doing it anyway. Funds from this tax should be used to subsidise purchases of fresh fruit and vegetables, especially for those in remote areas. Now, governments don't like hypothecated taxes, but I think we basically need them. We know that changing tax rates sufficiently can change consumption. It works with cigarettes. It also worked when the Northern Territory introduced extra taxes on full-strength beer and reduced the taxes on light beer. This was in the late 1990s. Consumption patterns changed quite dramatically as did accidents, domestic violence, and some of the health problems associated with alcohol. When the alcohol industry opposed the taxes and they were removed, consumption and the associated social and health problems reverted to their previous levels. Some of these suggestions will be criticised, and I'll be told this is a utopia that I live in. You're allowed to live there when you're as old as I am. And clearly they will not suit those who basically want to sell more of their products. But if we take note of the vast body of evidence showing the increased personal and societal costs of obesity, we can no longer be content to do nothing. No single action will fix the obesity problem, but the lack of a silver bullet doesn't mean we shouldn't take action. Only attention to multiple factors can solve the problem. And I believe that government action is the key to most solutions. Perhaps the best way for the processed food industry to be part of the obesity solution is to let government act for the public good. Governments intervene in road safety with speed limits, compulsory seat belts and bicycle helmets. Governments, government intervention dramatically cuts cigarette use when education did very little. Why do we have so much difficulty accepting that governments should intervene in the obesity crisis and why do governments have so much difficulty doing what their expert committees always recommend? I suggest that it is intense lobbying from the affected industries that stops action actually happening. 
but government coffers are going to have to pay for the results of overconsumption, so I think it is time government acted. Thank you.